Hi, my name is Janine Weisbos, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about different analysis methods that have been developed for um, resting state fMRI. Um, I'm going to start with an overview and then I'm going to explain some commonly used methods very briefly in just one or two slides and then I'm going to finish on a comparison. It can be a little bit confusing because a lot of different methods have been developed for analyzing resting state fMRI data. Um, here I'm listing just a few of them. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, these are some of the most commonly used methods and I've separated them out into two categories. So on the left hand side are what I'm referring to as voxel based methods, which basically just means that the output of these methods is a brain map or multiple brain maps. Um, meaning that these methods estimate a value for each individual spatial location, so either a voxel or a gray matter uh, uh, coordinate if you're working on the surface. Whereas on the right-hand side, for the node-based methods, um, the output is not uh, a spatial map, because what these methods do is they start by reducing the spatial information um, across the entire brain uh, into a set of nodes. Um, and then performing the analysis uh, based on the nodes or the connections or edges between those nodes. And so what I'll do over the next few slides is go over each of these um, methods and um, talk in uh, one or two slides, uh, just really briefly summarizing um, how these methods work and then also some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods. So let's start off with seed-based correlation analysis. Uh, the idea here uh, is that you pick one region of the brain. So for example, in the figure, uh, the blue region at the top, which is in the posterior cingulate cortex, uh, and then you extract uh, an average time series from that seed region of interest um, across all of the voxels that are included in the seed. Um, and then you calculate the correlation coefficient for every voxel of the brain with that seed uh, time series. And that gives you a map, as you can see at the bottom here, which is a whole brain map of connectivity or correlation with the region of interest. And this was one of the first um, methods that was used in resting state fMRI. And it's really easy to interpret. It's really intuitive to think about this map as being the posterior cingulate connectivity map, whole brain connectivity map. Um, there's also no correspondence problem because this is a simple map. So there's no, uh, if you use the same seed for different subjects, then the interpretation of the map is the same across all of the different subjects. Um, however, some of the downsides using seed-based correlation analysis, first of all, there's a bias in terms of where exactly you place your seed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And secondly, this is a fairly simplistic model of the complex organization that we know is present in the brain. So by ignoring some of the other networks that are present, we might be collapsing information in a way uh, that is not quite truthful to the uh, more detailed and more extensive um, uh, connectivity organization in the brain. So to talk a little bit more about seed selection bias, uh, there have been studies that have shown that even moving the seed around by just a small amount um, can create quite substantial changes in the uh, whole brain connectivity map that you get out of a seed-based cor seed correlation analysis. And this is an example here. So there are uh, three different seeds that are all in the posterior cingulate cortex just moved around by a small amount. So these are the circles in uh, green, red, and blue. And then the, fig the brain figure on the right shows to what degree the uh, resulting seed-based correlation maps agree with each other. So in the white area uh, are brain regions that are captured or that show up in the seed-based correlation map, regardless of which seed are, are, is being used. And you can see that there are some white regions, but all of the colored areas show differences between the different seed locations. And so that's really important because it means that uh, it can be difficult to relate the results from your study to results from other studies. Even if those other studies have used very similar seeds, they might not have been in exactly the same location. The second method that I want to talk about a little bit is independent components analysis or ICA. Um, which is a data-driven method that tries to identify or summarize the data set as a whole 
uh, into a number of different networks where each network is um, described by a spatial map, as you can see here, and an accompanying time course. And this addresses some of the um, uh, downsides of using seed-based correlation analysis because it's a multivariate approach that um, describes or summarizes the entire data set. And so it really captures the complex organization into multiple different networks as opposed to seed-based correlation analysis. Um, and the other advantage is that if you combine, for example, a group ICA with georegression analysis, then you can test for differences between subjects or between groups in terms of both the shape of the networks, but also the amplitude or the localized strength of the network. Some of the challenges with using ICA are, first of all, that it can be a little bit hard to interpret because this is a more multivariate and a more complex summary of the data set. It doesn't quite have that simplistic, intuitive um, way of interpreting the results. Um, and the second downside potentially is that this is a fully data-driven approach, so you don't have control over the decomposition. You don't have control over the way that the, that the networks are broken down um, because that's driven by information in the data. And so it might, for example, be that in one of your studies, you find two uh, networks that together form the default one network. It gets split into two networks in, in when you run ICA. And when you repeat that analysis in a different sample for a different study, um, then the breakdown might be slightly different. And that can make it a little bit harder to compare different studies uh, and interpret the results in a consistent way. One of the node-based methods that you might have heard about uh, is using graph theory. Um, and the idea here is that essentially graph theory starts with the same steps as doing a network modeling analysis. So um, splitting the brain up, parcelating the brain up into a number of nodes, extracting time series from each of the nodes, building a network matrix. But then graph theoretical summary measures aim to capture some of the topological features of that network matrix. So graph theory measures tend to be single values, either one value for the network for all of the regions and the whole the, for the whole brain, or individual values for, for example, individual nodes. Summarizing topological features such as small world principles, uh, minimum path length, clustering coefficients, um, whether a node is a hub, um, the degree of the nodes, um, and the, the advantage of these measures is that they're really, really simple summary measures that capture important features of the um, topological organization of regions and of the, the, the brain as a whole. And that can be really advantageous if all you want is a simple numerical biomarker. Um, However, there's a couple of downsides for graph theory measures. One of them is that network matrices are often binarized before being able to estimate these summary measures, meaning that there's a threshold of the correlation and everything above that threshold is a connection and anything below that threshold, any edges that are below that threshold are unconnected. Um, this is not by definition the case, but it's often the case um, for graph theory measures. And it runs the risk of losing some information that is present in that um, in those weighted edges and the second thing is that it can be a little bit difficult to interpret what graph theory measures mean in terms of um, what's what's changing in the brain so for example uh, if if patients uh, have less small world of networks than controls, then uh, what is it actually meaning in terms of what's changing in, in the brain? And that can be, it, it, it just means that it's a little bit further away from the data and it can be a little bit harder to interpret. Another node-based method that I wanna to touch on briefly is dynamic causal modeling or DCM. This is a biophysical model that tries to capture neural spiking and convolution with the human dynamic response function in order to um, predict or model directed connectivity, so causal connectivity from one region to another region. 
Um, and so some of the advantages are that it um, allows you to draw stronger conclusions. So rather than just functional connectivity, it allows you to say something about the directionality of the connectivity. But some of the challenges with dynamic causal modeling are that in order to draw those stronger conclusions, you have to usually make more assumptions. So for example, you have to assume um, what the shape of the hemodynamic response function is. Um, and also because there are more parameters in the model that have to be estimated, usually that leads to a limitation of the number of comparisons you can do in terms of the model space. Um, and that's okay if you have a small number of nodes and you only want to test a small number of configurations of directions and connections between those nodes. Um, but if you want to do a whole brain analysis, the model space becomes bigger because you have many more nodes and potential connections and directions that you want to um, infer upon and estimate. And so for resting state, this is still somewhat limited, but it would be really exciting if we were able to use this uh, more principled model uh, to draw stronger conclusions about connectivity. This is an overview of several different node-based methods. Um, essentially, the axis in here goes from closeness to the data to being a little bit further removed from the data. Effective connectivity tries to draw stronger conclusions about the patterns that we see in the data relative to functional connectivity. And then graph theory is even further removed in terms of being, in terms of describing higher level summaries of the structure in the network. On this slide, I want to show an example of the same data um, being analyzed in two different ways. So on the left hand side here, we have results from a, a node based analysis doing uh, network modeling analysis and then looking at which edges differ between subjects with uh, low uh, IQ and high IQ. And on the right hand side, uh, we have results from doing group ICA followed by dual regression. And this just illustrates that depending on the choice that you make for which method that you choose, the way that those results present themselves and the way that you might end up interpreting those results um, might be very different. Um, so on the left hand side, we're looking at pairwise connections between regions. And you can see here that I'm highlighting uh, a couple of pairwise connections that differ between these two groups. Um, whereas on the right hand side, we're looking at the shape and strength of network changes. So in um, yellow and orange is the group ICA map that the results relate to. So in green are regions that are more strongly related to this network um, for subjects with high intelligence compared with subjects with low intelligence. Um, and this is a really nice illustration because whilst you can see that some of the same regions are to some degree involved, uh, the way that this gets um, represented in your results differs very strongly um, between different methods that you might choose to analyze the data. So the analysis kind of determines the window that you take, the approach that you take for capturing changes in the data. Uh, so to build on that a little bit more, node-based methods, importantly, are not sensitive at all to shape changes in connectivity patterns because the nodes are determined at the start of the analysis and the nodes don't change, are not allowed to change in terms of their shape and location as part of the analysis. So if you expect, for example, as part of development um, in, in children, if you expect that networks might change in terms of their spatial organization, then node-based methods are not a good fit for that. And voxel-based methods are more appropriate for that. And also in node-based methods, uh, an advantage there is that you do have a typically a smaller multiple comparisons problem. So instead of correcting for all of the um, voxels in the brain, you only have to correct for all of the edges. And of course, how many edges you have depends on the number of nodes, but it's typically fewer than the number of voxels in the brain. Voxel-based methods, on the other hand, uh, are able to test for spatial changes in connectivity patterns. And a group ICA, of course, can also test for strength changes or amplitude changes. And so with that, I'll talk about this last slide here. And I like this slide a lot because um, this is to encourage you to spend some time thinking about what method is the right method for, um, for your study. Um, because all of these methods exist because they all have something to contribute. They all are useful and valuable and valid um, for testing different types of research questions.
Um, but instead of just picking the same resting state analysis method that someone else in your lab has done before or that your PI always uses, um, it might be useful to think a little bit more about your specific research question and what method is most suitable for that. Um, Resting state um, analyses or studies are often described as exploratory. Um, and I actually think that's not entirely fair because often when we do a resting state study, we do have some hypothesis about how connectivity might change given what we know about the literature or about the psychopathology of the patients that we're studying. Um, and so think about how you, like what would the ideal figure and text in your discussion be and decide based on that what the best method is for actually, what the best window is on the data for actually being able to interpret it in that way. Um, so for example, if your hypothesis is at the level of resting state networks, so for example, if you think there's a change in the default mode network or in the front parietal network, um, then doing ICA plus dual regression is a really good method to choose because um, that those analysis methods work at the level of those networks. That's the unit of representation for those methods. Um, on the other hand, if you want to, um, for example, help your clinician and give them like a really simple individual value per subject, that your clinician might be able to interpret or put some threshold on to say whether someone is at risk or not, then maybe something like graph theory that condenses down complex information uh, into summary values might be really valuable. Um, if your question is at the level of specific connections in the brain, so for example, you know, how does the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex change in my patients who suffer from anxiety, then network modeling analysis is the right approach to take because it looks at these edges between those regions. Um, as long as you make sure that you define the nodes in the way uh, that is most informative for the research question and the study that you have. If you'd like to draw more stringent conclusions about the biophysical system that underlies the regions that you're looking at, um, and you have some specific hypothesis about the organization and directionality of those connections, then doing something di like dynamic causal modeling might be a really good fit. And lastly, if you want to talk about connectomics, i.e. all possible connections in the brain, um, then probably network modeling analysis is the best fit for that, is most commonly used for that approach. So, so it can be really valuable to spend a little bit of time thinking about what would you what do you want from your study and decide the best method? And also actually put the justification of why you decided to chose the method into your paper so that you can help the reader, so that you can inform the reader about why you took the approach that you, that you took in the end. And so with that, I'll finish. Um, I'll point out some resources. Uh, so if you have any questions about um, using Epsilon Nets to implement network modeling analysis or if you or um, in terms of interpretation, get in touch with all of us at the Epsilon mailing list. Uh, we wrote a book uh, that discusses a lot of these different resting state methods uh, in a lot more detail than I've done here, which you might find valuable. Um, and also to point out that all of the links at the bottom of the slides are, um, you can click on them to find the, the specific paper uh, and read more uh, about it. Thank you so much for listening.